Hey math students, today we're going to talk about functions. This is one of the most uh, um, fundamental uh, concepts of modern mathematics, is the concept of a function. A function is a relationship between two variables, the independent variable and the dependent variable. Okay? A variable, remember, is a value that can change. It's not constant. Now, what makes this a function is that one variable, the dependent one, is completely dependent on this variable over here, the independent one. Okay? Let me give you some examples, and I think that'll uh, kind of clear it up for you. So, uh, let's look at our first example. Our first example is f of x equals x plus 2. Perfectly fine uh, example of a function. The function f and by the way, the way you read that is f of x. It's not f times x. It's f of x. So the function f just takes a value and adds 2 to it. So if x were 4, f of x would be 6. If x were negative 2, f of x would be 0. Um, g of x is x rounded to the closest integer. It doesn't seem like it would be a function because it doesn't, it's, not, it's not a nice little mathematically written formula. But this is a function, because no matter what number you have for x, you can round that to an integer, and that integer will be g of x. It gets you one answer, and it gets you... That answer, g of x, is completely dependent on what x is, okay? And when I say dependent, what I mean is you can't say, well, sometimes g of x is going to be this, and sometimes g of x is going to be that. No, no. There's a particular answer, and it's completely dependent on whatever the value of x is. So... Third example, h of x is x squared minus 4. Yeah, okay. So uh, if x is, let's say, negative 2, then h of x is going to be negative 2 squared root of 4 minus 4, which is 0. If x is 2, then h of x is 2 squared root of 4 minus 4, which is 0, okay? Now, notice that even though x, when it's 2, gives you h of x, which is 0, and x, when it's negative 2, gets you h of x, which is 0, that's okay h of x can repeat itself, but you can't have one different x that corresponds to two different h of x's. That would not be a function. Uh, then we have p of t. Notice we're using t now as our independent variable instead of x. It doesn't have to be x. It usually is, but it doesn't have to be. So p of t is the cost to park my car at a particular airport parking lot for t hours. Now, as long as this parking lot is consistent in its pricing policy, this is a function. Because I can go to that parking lot and I can say, how much does it cost to park for half an hour? How much does it park, cost to park for 12 hours? If they can give me answers, and if those answers are consistent, yes, that is definitely a function. Okay? So, now let's look at how we write functions. Let's look at what we call function notation. Now, earlier I said we had a function f of x, and I labeled it... Can we read that? Let me use a different marker. That looks better. Okay. f of x, and we're saying that f of x is x plus 2. Okay. Well, what if I did f of 3? Well... All you have to do is say, x is apparently 3 now, so this is going to be 3 plus 2, and I know what that is, that's 5. So f of 3 is going to be 5, and f of 6 is going to be 8, and f... Uh, sorry about that, my phone is going off. Um, and f of negative 4 is negative 2, and you get the idea, okay? And uh, what if we have g of x? Remember, g of x was x rounded to the closest integer, right? That's what g of x was. So if that's what g of x is, then g of 9.2 will equal 9. Then g of... Uh, 7.8 will equal 8, and g of, let's say, pi is going to equal, well, 3. All right? 
This is function notation, and what we're doing here is we are evaluating functions. There's two verbs that I want you to know. One is evaluate and one is solve. When we evaluate functions, we do this. Okay, we tell what the value of the function is given a particular x. When we solve, well, then we would say, what if, remember, f of x is x plus 2. So what if f of x is 19? Then what is x? And we would have to say, hmm, okay, well, let's see. Uh, that means x plus 2, which is what f of x is, is 19. So let me subtract 2 from both sides, and I get x is 17, and that's my answer. Okay, that's when we're solving. Solving means you know what f of x is, you want to find out what x is. And we can also do that for g of x. Remember, g of x is uh, x rounded to the closest integer. So let's say g of x is 5. So that means x is... Hmm. What number rounded to the closest integer is 5? Well, actually, there's, there's a lot of them. So x isn't going to have a particular value this time when I solve it. It could have, well, a lot of, an infinite number of values. So let's see. What's the smallest number that I can round up to 5? That would be 4.5. Anything smaller than that rounds down to 4. What's the largest number I can round up to 5? Or I can round, round to 5? Well, that would be the number right before 5.5. So I guess the way I'm going to say this is x has to be less than 5.5, but it's got to be greater than or equal to 4.5. So that's a good way of writing it. Another way to write it using interval notation would be to say x is in the interval 4.5 to 5.5. And notice here, I put a square bracket here saying we're including 4.5, but a round parenthesis there saying we are not including 5.5. Okay, let's see what we got now. All right, let's, uh, let's take a function, f of x, equals negative 3x plus 7. And I'm going to say that f of x is a function over the real numbers. Now, when I say a function over the real numbers, what that means is x must be a real number, and f of x also must be a real number. Now, what I'm looking for now is the domain and the range of this function. So the first question is, what are those? You've probably heard this before. You've probably heard, oh yeah, the domain is all the x's and the range is all the y's. Well, that's kind of true as long as you're defining x's and y's correctly. The domain is all the possible independent variables, or the, all the possible values that the independent variable can take. The range is all the possible values that the dependent variable can take. So the domain is going to be all the possible values for x. And the range is going to be all the possible values for f of x. Now sometimes when a, when a function is defined, the domain is just handed to you. And that's when that's, we call that explicit. It's an explicit domain. Okay? Here the domain's not, not it, uh, explicitly defined. Therefore, we have to uh, infer what it's going to be, okay? It's, it's an implicit domain. So instead of saying, what can x be? It's much easier to answer the, answer the question, what can't x be? Because there's only a few rules that we have in math that where you just, you can't do something. So let's think about what they are. Well, you can't divide by zero. That's a biggie. So no dividing by zero. Is that a problem here? No, it's not because nothing's being divided anywhere. What's another one? And remember, we're talking about real numbers. And since we're talking about real numbers, that means no taking the square root of a negative number. Could that happen here? Oh, yes, it could. There's a square root right there. So what that tells us is whatever's in the radicand, that's the whatever's, the radicand is whatever's inside this radical here. Whatever's in there uh, must be at least zero 
Well, at least is just another way of saying greater than or equal to zero. Okay, well shoot, that's just an inequality that I can solve. I'll subtract seven from both sides, I get three x greater than or equal to negative seven, which tells me if I divide both sides by three, that x must be greater than or equal to negative seven thirds. That's my domain of this function. Okay, so what did we do here? <clears throat> we thought about a, some rules that cannot be broken. And really when you're looking at functions and you're trying to figure out what rules can I not break, there's only three that I can think of off the top of my head. Don't divide by zero, don't try to take the square root of a negative number, and don't try to take the logarithm of zero or a negative number, okay? Uh, and those are really the big three, and frankly, right now, you're mainly gonna see the first two of them. So whenever you're dividing, make sure you're not dividing by zero. Whenever you're taking a square root, make sure you're not taking the square root of a negative number. And once we get to doing logs, don't try to take the log of, a, uh, of zero or a negative number. Make sure that whatever you're taking a log of is a positive number. Okay, so now given this, what's the range gonna be? What could the range possibly be? Oh, and by the way, let's, let's go ahead and say x. I always like writing my uh, domains in a couple of different ways, using inequalities and also using interval notation. So we're gonna say this goes from negative 7 thirds to positive infinity. Remember, don't ever put a bracket on infinity. It's just too big. You can't handle it. Okay, um, <clears throat> uh, so let's find the range now, okay? A couple of different ways to do this. One way is you look at the function and you, you, you gotta sort of think about it. Uh, this is an absolute value function. Well, as numbers get bigger, I'm sorry, this is a square root function. I don't know what got into my head there. This is a square root function, and as numbers, as positive numbers get bigger, their square roots also get bigger. So it's an increasing function, but it's got a negative in front of it. So that means it's a decreasing function. So as x gets bigger, f of x is gonna get smaller, all right? So take the smallest x we have, negative 7 thirds. If you plug that in here, you get zero. The square root of zero is also zero, and negative zero is also zero. So that means when x is negative 7 thirds, f of x is zero. Now, make it bigger, okay? Don't go straight to infinity, just go bigger than that. As you get numbers that are bigger than negative 7 thirds, three times x is also gonna be bigger, okay? Three x plus seven is also gonna be greater the square root of that will also get greater and greater and greater, but then you make it negative, which makes it lesser and lesser and lesser. So that means this is going to go down. So that means f of x, your range, will be somewhere between negative infinity and zero. And I'm afraid I didn't explain that very well. As I'm explaining it, I'm thinking, you're not doing a very good job. So let's look at it a totally different way. When you take the square root of a number, your answer is a non-negative number, right? If the radicand is zero, then your answer is zero. If the radicand is positive, then your answer is positive. Therefore, if you put a negative in front of that, your answer is going to be either zero or negative. Well, all numbers that are either zero or negative go from negative infinity to zero. All right? Uh, let's, so keeping that in mind, um, what would the, Let's not worry about the range right now. Let's just worry about the domain. What would the domain of g of x equals 4x over x minus 2 equal? What is that domain? Okay. Think about the rules. Can't divide by 0. That means it's not the uh, numerator that's the issue. It's the denominator. That's what we're dividing by. So that means we cannot divide by zero, x minus two cannot be zero. So if x minus two is not equal to zero, add two to both sides and you get x is not equal to two. That is our domain, okay? And again, another way to write that would be uh, x is in the interval from negative infinity to two, union two to infinity, parentheses on both sides so you're not including it in, a, in either interval there, all right? Okay. Now, some, uh, 
some functions, like I said, are going to have the domain just handed to you. Let me give you an example here. Uh, and uh, this can be thought of as an explicit domain. It's just explicitly stated. Or it can be thought of as a restricted domain because your domain is n not as big as, as, as it might be without this particular restriction. Let's say f of x is uh, x over 4 plus 1 point... Let me write this right. Plus 1.99. Okay? But only when x is uh, 12 or 16 or 24. That's all. That is an explicit domain because now in order to find the domain you just go, there it is. It's right there. Now, what's the range going to be? Well, it's a finite domain. There's only three numbers in the domain. Therefore, just take those numbers, evaluate the function at each of those numbers and find out what it would be. Let's make a table. So x can be 12 or 16 or 24. So if x is 12, f of x is going to be 12 over 4, which is 3, plus 1.99, that's 4.99. Uh, if x is 16, that'll be 16 over 4, which is 4, plus 1.99, that's 5.99. And if x is 24, that's going to be 24 over 4, which is 6, plus 1.99, that is 7.99. And what this is, is this is a function that gives you the cost of a soda at a particular movie theater. If you order a 12-ounce soda, it's going to cost $4.99. If you order a 16-ounce, it's going to cost $5.99. And if you order a 24-ounce soda, it'll cost $7.99, which, first of all, is too expensive. And also, good God, don't drink a 24-ounce soda. That's terrible for you. But I digress. Um, let's say we have another function, which is... Uh, we'll call this h of t. And we'll say that h of t is going to be negative 16 t squared plus 256, okay? And I'm going to say this is only for t between 0 and 4. So again, it's an explicitly defined domain. Now, what would the range be? Well, let's see. When t is 0, it's going to be 0 plus 256. So that means uh, 256. And as t gets bigger, this will also get bigger, but that, that means this will get smaller. So it's going to be going down from 256. And when it gets all the way up to 4, you're going to have negative 16 times 4 squared, which is negative 16 times 16, which is negative 256, plus 256, which is 0. Okay, so, and, and remember, between 0 and 4, uh, h of t can take all of the values between 256 and 0. So that means the range is going to be uh, h of t is between 0 and 256. And what this function is, is it's uh, h of t is telling you how high up a penny is when you drop a penny from a distance, from a, an altitude of 256 feet. It's going to take four seconds to hit the ground. So that's why we restricted our domain to zero to four because, well, after four, it's going to be a different function. It's, it, it changes its velocity. Okay. So um, how do we... How do we illustrate functions? How do we describe functions? How do we define functions? Well, we've, we, so far we've been doing it using equations. And that's probably the most common way to define a function. It is by far not the only way, though. Uh, you can have, well, let's look at this. Uh, you can have equations. You can also define it using a graph. All right, here's a perfectly uh, good example of a graph of a function. Now, you've probably heard of something called the vertical line rule. Okay, and you probably remember the vertical line rule says that if I can draw a vertical line through a function, then 
it's not a function. That's right, although it's a poorly constructed sentence. But anyway, uh, let's say we have a graph, and let's say we have, it's coming along like this, and it goes like that, all right? And that means I can take a vertical line here. Oops, my marker ran out. That means I can take this vertical line over here and get this point and this point and this point. Now, if those are all points on a vertical line, think about it. That means x is the same for all three of those points, but your y-coordinate is going to be different. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm actually glad I said it that way because uh, we haven't talked about y yet. We've talked about x and f of x, x and g of x, x and h of x, but when you graph a function, you have an x-axis and you have a y-axis. Okay, this is, this curve here, if, if, we, if we could say that this curve were a function, which as it turns out we can't, this would be the graph of y equals f of x. Now just like f of x, for every single x, must have only one answer, if you have a vertical line that passes through that graph, that means you're coming up with three different answers for that one x. No, no. That's what a function is not. That's why the vertical line test is what it is. It's, uh, that's, that's why it works in testing whether a function is actually a function. Um, what other ways can we uh, describe functions? Well, we can use a table. Table is a perfectly fine way of doing it. Um, now, the thing about a table is, if you have a finite domain, then a table's great. You can just describe the whole thing uh, uh, in your table. If you have an infinite domain, then the table is very good at giving you a finite subset of that function. All right? And then a couple of other ways that we have of defining functions or illustrating functions is using ordered pairs or a mapping diagram. And uh, these two illustrations here actually uh, show the exact same function. In the ordered pairs, we have four different points, if you, th you think about it that way, four different ordered pairs. So uh, what we're seeing there is if uh, we have f of negative 1, that equals negative 7, f of 4 equals 9, f of 3 equals 6, and f of 5 equals 6. That's what I get out of those ordered pairs I'm just putting the x and the y, the x and the y, the x and the y, the x and the y. And if you look at the mapping diagram, you have an arrow that goes from negative 1 to negative 7. And you have an arrow that goes from 3 to 6. And you have another arrow that goes from 5 to 6. And your last arrow that goes from 4 to 9. Okay? So both of those uh, illustrations there show the exact same function. All right. Last thing that I want to go over, and that is, there's a particular type of function called a piecewise function. And let's look at p of t. And I'm going to define p of t to be 4 uh, for um, 0 less than t less than 1. I'm going to have it be 4 times t for 1 less than or equal to t less than 3, and I'm going to have it be 12 for 3 for any t that is greater than or equal to 3. Okay? This is a piecewise function. It's defined in pieces. And the way it's defined is you take the, the domain and you split it up. And you have three different equations for each little piece of the domain, okay? Uh, if I were to find uh, p of 0.5, I would say, well, let's see. t is 0.5 here. So when is t 0 0.5? It's, it's in that interval right there. That means my answer is going to be 4. p of 1.5, let's see, 1.5 is bigger than that. It's, it's in that interval right there. It's between 1 and 3. So that means it's going to be 4 times 1.5, which I believe is 6. And P of, let's say, 3. 
3 is greater than or equal to 3, so that's going to be 12. And p of 4 is also going to be 12, because anything greater than 3 is going to get you an answer of 12. Is this a function? Yes, it's definitely a function because it's nice and consistent. You never get uh, ambiguous answers. And what this function might be is that parking lot we were talking about at the very beginning of the video. Um, perhaps they have a minimum charge of four, and then between one and three hours, it just goes up linearly, and you have a maximum charge of 12. Could be. I don't know. Given, park, given airport parking lot rates, that's a pretty good one. Okay, that's probably enough for now uh, for functions. That gives you a good uh, head start. I think most of this has been a review, but uh, I hope it helps. Okay, till the next time.